This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good morning, everyone. Could you please take your seats for this fireside chat without a fire? Um, this is the first in a series of rapid-fire, 20-minute insider conversations, the first one on essential surgery. My name is Gavin Yamey. I lead E2PI, a global health policy think tank, the Evidence to Policy Initiative, here in the Global Health Group at UCSF. And one of my other hats is that I am the member of a small international expert committee called the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery uh, at globalsurgery.info. And we are exploring ways in which we can sustainably and equitably scale up uh, surgical services worldwide. I think equity is proving to be a dominant theme today, initiated by Harvey Feinberg's wonderful talk. And I suspect that systems may turn out to be another dominant word of the, t of the day. Our second commission meeting was in Freetown, Sierra Leone, just recently. Um, I'm also over the 21-day incubation period. Not sure about uh, Paul. But what was really... <laughs> <laughs> what was, uh, don't worry. I get, I get right now. <laughs> what's really striking about <laughs> what's really striking about that meeting is that, you know, the when you think about the kinds of systems that you need to scale up essential safe surgery, they're pretty much the same as the systems that you need for outbreak management. And I hope we're going to get into some of those issues over the next 20 minutes. Um, so. With us today, two of the, uh, the real heroes of global health, really beloved global health leaders, two of my personal heroes, and um, come on, let's face it, it's the pinnacle of my career to be sharing a stage with them. <laughs> you know, you're all thinking it. Um, and uh, I suspect that it's downhill from today from, from my point of view, but let's, not, let's hope not, eh? So, um, Haile Debas is so many things. Uh, he is director of the Global Health Institute, and Maurice Galante, professor of surgery, and he has been the chair of the Department of Surgery. He's been vice chancellor, chancellor. Um, he was the founding executive director of Global Health Sciences, um, and we are delighted to have him with us today from the left coast and then from the right coast at Harvard, Paul Farmer, the Colocotrones University professor, University professorships are the highest academic distinction uh, at Harvard. He chairs the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine in the Medical School. He's chief of the Division of Global Health at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And he is, of course, co-founder of Partners in Health, one of the most inspirational organizations working in global health. Um, that says on its website it is relentlessly committed to improving the health of poor and marginalized people. Thanks to both for joining us. Highly, I wanted to kick off with a question that certainly it's on my mind at times, and I suspect that it may be on the minds of many people in the audience. And that is, when we think of global health, we tend to think of transmissible threats, the kinds of threats that no national boundaries, no, no national boundaries, they can cross borders, they are threats to all of us, and where there's a, a clear rationale for international collective public health action. We don't tend to think of surgery, we think of Ebola outbreaks, we think of the big three, AIDS, TB, malaria. What has surgery got to do with global health? Thank you, Gavin. Uh, before I answer you, may I just embarrass uh, Paul, uh, I haven't, do done, I, haven't, I haven't done it to his face, but, I, but this time I have the opportunity. And I just want to say, Paul has been my inspiration. Every time I did global health, Paul has been there uh, in spirit. And he is truly the leader of all of us who, who work in global health. And I'm very proud to have you here with us today. So now to your provocative question. 
I knew you will ask a provocative question. Surely, uh, surgery is not something that pops to your mind when somebody says global health. And indeed, uh, you know, the control and treatment of infections, pandemics, is far more urgent and pressing problem now. But surgery has a number of important uh, roles to play in global health. As you know, 500,000 women die during pregnancy and childbirth. A significant portion of them die from uh, obstruct, complications of obstructed labor. Just the provision of cesarean section, which can be provided effectively uh, in a district hospital and be done not even by surgeons, but by skilled surgical technicians, can save the lives of mothers and fetuses. But in addition, it prevents another dreadful complication, which is uh, an obstetric fistula. If, if cesarean section is done in a timely way, you can prevent that. And of course, surgery is needed to treat uh, fistulas, which are really the biggest burden to the individual, to the family, and the community. So that's one big area where surgery plays. Another big area is trauma. You know, every year, some five million people die from trauma, mostly from road traffic accidents. And this, most of the deaths are in the developing world. And the, the issue uh, is also that uh, the people who die are the young people in their productive uh, uh, age group. So prevention, control of trauma would be a, an exceptionally important. I believe, personally, that the single most important thing we can do for uh, developing countries is helping, help them develop trauma systems. Now, there are other areas where surgery is important. It is important in, in treating cataracts and returning millions and millions of people to, uh, uh, to, to work and to economic support of their family and communities. There's all the congenital abnormalities which can be easily treated uh, by surgery. So in many ways, what you are saying is that surgery could be seen as a global public health tool that could help us to reach many of the Millennium Development Goals. Actually, even MDG 1 on poverty, since cataract treatment helps poverty, um, MDG 4, 5, and 6 around women's health, right. children's health, and actually even HIV around male circumcision. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Uh, let me just add that uh, sur sur essential surgery, I think, should be a component of the primary care surgery. So, so that when you develop systems of care, surgery, essential surgery, should really be part of that. Paul, you wrote an editorial a while back with your dear friend and colleague from Partners in Health, Jim Kim, who is now present of the World Bank, and by the way, how cool is that that we have a physician leading the World Bank? Um, <laughs> Global Health Bank. In which you said that surgery is the neglected stepchild of global health. What did you mean by that? Well, um, first of all, now I have, of course, have been sitting here thinking, how am I going to say <laughs> something to Haile that <laughs> could top that? Um, but I was thinking how lucky we've been um, the people in in in, uh, in my generation there that there have been uh, senior leaders in academic medicine out there saying it is not you know Harvard Medical School's mission statement to reduce human suffering caused by disease in the Boston area 
just as it's not the mission of US, UCSF, we heard it beautifully said today, to um, you know, think of global health as something that happens only in the Bay Area. And that, that, that was a lot easier to do 25 years ago when we were finishing medical school than it was 35 or 40 years ago. I mean, in my, in my internship class in internal medicine, I shared a clinic with Jim Kim and Chris Murray. Right there. <laughs> and so we argued about this stuff on when we were trading emergency room shifts or whatever for years. Uh, and, and so we have some familiarity, even though we come at this problems, these sets of problems from different angles, because we've had people like you to you know, push forward uh, space for us. Um, a neglected stepchild. I, I think that uh, if you take um, Chris's work and the work of uh, Dean Jamison and many others, uh, which really didn't exist, um, and, and highly as well, a lot of you have worked on an assessment of, of the burden of disease, right? And if you take a burden of disease approach, you'd see already when we made those comments in 2008 that uh, there wasn't anything being done in terms of health systems to address surgical disease. And another thing that, that, that was quite obvious um, is that a lot of non-surgical disease turned into surgical disease, right? And even that temporal challenge was pretty much ignored by most of our colleagues in epidemiology and, and a lot of the burden of disease literature as well. If you don't treat a staph or a strep infection early on, for example, it often becomes surgical disease. If you don't treat a pneumococcal pneumonia, it causes an empyema, et cetera, et cetera. And I could go on, uh, trust me, as my surgical colleagues go, no, I do go on. So We have a timekeeper here. We should already flash the, the warning. The neglected <laughs> stepchild part is inarguable, right? Based on burden disease and gap, the equity question that Harvey laid out. We are doing a very poor job integrating basic surgical services into health systems that can reach poor people. But I think also that we deserve some of the criticisms ourselves, you know? If the surgeons are saying, well, no one gives us room at the table, um, I think that's not, I think that's not the most honest way to discuss this. It's they need to get to the global health equity table and fight for access to these basic services that Haile just line, uh, laid out for people living in poverty. And, uh, and that's why we had the meeting in Freetown in the middle of or what would prove to be early on in the Ebola epidemic, and that's why we wouldn't change the venue. So help us to understand, both of you, how can low- and middle-income countries, together, of course, with donors, the international community, uh, civil society, NGOs, how can they, we, collectively, overcome some of the challenges? And I'm thinking here of lack of surgical staff, lack of sutures and stuff, um, poor working conditions, low morale, these can seem quite overwhelming. Um, how do we begin? Help us through where we go from here. Well, I think nobody is more qualified than Paul to answer that question, so I'll defer to him. Well, you know, I, I think that uh, obviously the main issue is resources. If we have staff, if, if we look that we need staff, stuff, space, proper space, and, and systems, then you can't do that with the user fee model or a out-of-pocket system, which you know Marchesen and many others have called the oops system. <laughs> it's just not the way to finance basic surgical uh, care. Um, I don't think it's the right way to uh, finance basic primary care in general. And if you want that in, we have to stop being so lowball again as a community, a global health academic community. We, we've, we've spent more time arguing about, well, why are you doing cancer and not surgery or AIDS versus TB or vaccine preventable illness versus trauma? That's just, you know, the, the, the pathogens must be cheering us on <laughs> as we are a house divided when it's not about Ebola versus primary care, it's about you know, a health system with surveillance capacity and public health capacity that is also able to provide basic services. So I think a big part of why I'm bringing it back to us is the resource challenge has to be done here in these rooms with people who are, need to come together and say, we can't keep balkanizing global health. 
especially now for global health equ equity. I have amazingly been given a two-minute warning, but I'm going to take the prerogative of asking one question each of you. Haile, you have been a pioneer in conducting research on surgery, Mozambique and Tanzania in Uganda, showing you know, uh, shortages of health staff and high burdens. What is the role of surgery? What is the role of research in the global surgery movement? And what do you think are the big research questions that we don't know about? So because of time, I'll give you a staccato answer. Brilliant. Make it a haiku. <laughs> that is beyond me. Scholar, <laughs> scholars fight. Surgery <laughs> neglected. I only think for <laughs> Doom. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is very little reliable data in surgery to determine the, the burden of surgical diseases, to, to determine the safety of procedures, to determine the cost effectiveness of surgical procedures or the platforms on which surgical procedures can be formed. There's no study on how best to integrate essential surgery into the health systems and, uh, uh, and particularly in primary care systems. There is very little data on, on trauma, uh, the kind of data you need to develop the systems. So those are, those are some, and I will, I'll, I'll leave. In fact, how can I forget? There is very little work done on health systems financing. Big, yeah. big issue. Thanks, Tali. And Paul, I've actually got two interlinked questions. The first is, you and I were together in Freetown for the Surgical Commission meeting um, in the midst of the Ebola, in the Ebola crisis. Systems were on our mind. Are you hopeful that the world might seize this moment to once and for all realize that until we build delivery systems, we will all, always have these crises? And a related question, you have, you have talked about the need for a sort of surgical movement. Do you see such a movement building now? Um, I think it's taking root. Is it taking off? Yes, I, I, I am optimistic, and I do think it's happening. And again, I think uh, a meeting like this and people like you are going to speed that up or slow it down. And if we focus on the health systems uh, and building them out as we're asking the kind of questions that Haile mentioned. Listen, look, we already know that the case fatality rate of an untreated, uh, you know, uh, long bone fracture, you know, in a time of war, say, we, we, we can't pretend we don't know about the value of some basic surgical interventions. We do. And so, you know, we have to get going and build this delivery science by not subjecting poor people to some level of you know, evaluation that we wouldn't do here. We know, um, you know that you, you need to drain an empyema. We know that you need to, uh, how to fix a, you know, uh, make sure that an ex uh, external fracture doesn't lead to lifelong debility and death from sepsis because you know, it stays that way and on and on to say nothing of obstructed labor. So, Build it out. Get, you know, we come together. We say this is the health system strengthening about. We we need a snazzy, jazzy, um, you know, slogan. Uh, you know, we can't go around and say what do we want? Health systems now. When do we want it? When evidence-based medicine shows it to be necessary. <laughs> get something snazzy. I'm going to give the last word to Haile, who I believe has an announcement about. Yeah. A yeah. I just want uh, to announce that. Uh, the disease control priorities uh, uh, third edition is, is coming out this year. And the first volume to come is the volume on essential surgery. Of course, surgeons lead the, the pack, as you can see. And these flyers are around, so I hope you can, you can pick them up. Please don't go away. It takes a couple of minutes to mic up the next panel. We'll have Mary Wilson with us in a minute or two. Please give a huge round of applause for Haile and Paul.